Hello and welcome to another service of the Church of the Resurrection on Capitol Hill. My name is Dan Clare and I'm so glad to be leading you in worship. I invite you to stand and we'll enter into the presence of Almighty God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let's join together in praying the prayer of purity as we come into God's presence. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's sing his praises together. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. I invite you now to kneel and we will confess our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now stand and hear this good news for all who turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the word of Jesus to you. So let's sing his praises together. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day. 
tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace thy victory won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since thou in triumph leadest me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own I'm Maggie McNeely, and I live in the Capitol Hill neighborhood, and I've been attending Res for about a year and a half. Please join me in praying the Collect for Children. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed our congregation with the joy and care of children. Give us courage, patience, and wisdom as we bring them up in the faith that they might never know a day apart from you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. We've been studying the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, the story of beginnings. And last week, we talked about the very beginning of God's special family, the family of Abraham. God made a big promise to Abraham, a promise to give him a family. He didn't have any children. A promise to give him a land, a home. And a promise to bless his family. And that through his family, the whole world would one day be blessed. And God promised to be with Abraham and his family. Abraham had a son named Isaac. And Isaac had a son named Jacob. And today, our story is about Jacob's son, Joseph. And we are going to see how God keeps his promises to Abraham's family throughout many, many generations. Let's make our hearts quiet and get ready to hear from God's good words to us. Once, there was a man named Jacob. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. Do you remember Abraham? He was the man who God gave a special promise to. The one to whom God said, I will rescue the whole world through your family. And Jacob had many sons. But his youngest son, Joseph, was his favorite. Because Jacob had him when he was a very old man. And one day, Jacob gave Joseph a special gift, a new robe. It was beautiful and special. I wonder, what do you think it looked like? Maybe like our robe here with bright colors? Maybe it had special fabric or embroidery. Well, Joseph's robe, made the rest of his brothers jealous. And then everything got worse. Joseph, he had a special gift. He had special dreams. And he had a dream that he was a great king and that all his family 
including his brothers, bowed down to him. And he told his brothers about this dream. And Joseph's brothers became very angry. They hated him. They hated him even more because of his dreams. They hated him so much that they couldn't even say one kind thing about him. And one day, Joseph's brothers plotted to kill him. They said to one another when their father was not around, come, let's kill Joseph and throw him in one of the deep wells. And we can say that wild animals devoured him. Then we will see what becomes of his dreams. But one of his brothers said, let's not take his life for he is our brother. Let's just throw him in the well because this brother intended to come back and rescue Joseph. So that's what they did. They threw Joseph in a well. They took his long, beautiful robe from him. And they threw him in the deep well. It was deep, but it didn't have any water in it. Then as they looked up, they saw a caravan of merchants coming towards them. And the brothers said to one another, let's just sell Joseph to the merchants. So that's what they did. They sold their brother out of the well to the merchants for 20 pieces of silver. And the merchants took Joseph away from his homeland all the way to Egypt. Jacob, Joseph's father, was so sad when the br brothers told him that Joseph had been killed by wild animals. Jacob was so sad that none of his family could comfort him. He wept and he said, I'll go to the grave mourning my son. Meanwhile, in Egypt, things were not looking good for Joseph. He was in Egypt as a slave and he was accused of something that he didn't do and thrown in jail for it, even though he had done nothing wrong. God was with Joseph, even in jail. And sadness, evil, and sin are never the end of God's story. Joseph went from being a slave in Egypt to being one of the Pharaoh's most important advisors. You see, the Pharaoh had been having some strange and very scary dreams and he didn't know what they meant. And Joseph had a gift of understanding and interpreting dreams. So Joseph was able to go to Pharaoh and tell him what those dreams meant. And you know what the dreams were about? They were about a famine coming to the land, a famine for many, many years. And Joseph was able to advise Pharaoh and tell him that the famine was coming and that there wasn't going to be enough food, but that they could prepare for it. And Pharaoh was so pleased with Joseph that he took him out of jail and made him a prince. And Joseph helped the Pharaoh and all of Egypt prepare for the famine so that when it came, they would have food to eat. And many, many years later, back in Joseph's homeland, the, fair, the famine came too. And Joseph's family back home had run out of food. Everyone was hungry and they were in danger. If they didn't get food, 
they would soon starve to death. And God's special family, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would not survive. So, some of Joseph's brothers traveled to Egypt to look for food. Now, one of Joseph's jobs in Egypt was to sell some of the food from people who came from neighboring lands looking for food. So when Joseph's brothers came to Egypt, they actually came and saw Joseph, but they didn't recognize him. J Joseph's brothers bowed down before him, not realizing it was him. And when Joseph finally revealed to them who he was, that he was their brother, the one that they had sold into slavery, they were so shocked they couldn't say anything. And they were afraid because they knew that they had done wrong. They had sinned and now certainly they thought Joseph would punish them. But even though his brothers, his own flesh and blood had hurt him, hated him and wanted him dead, Joseph loved his brothers and he forgave them. Do not be afraid, Joseph said. Behind what you were doing, God was doing something good, and he was making everything right again. God sent me before you to save many lives. And we have had years of famine here in Egypt, but God sent me to make sure you and our family would survive. And now, here I am alive, hurry back to my father and tell him that I am well. Joseph did not punish his brothers. He rescued them. And God used Joseph to bring God's special family, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the land of Egypt to live safely. Now one day, God would send another prince. Like Joseph, this prince would leave his home, his father. Like Joseph, this prince, his brothers would hate him and want him dead. He would be sold for pieces of silver and he would be punished even though he didn't do anything wrong. But God would use this prince. Do you know who that prince is? The Prince of Peace, Jesus. God would use Jesus to do something amazing, to forgive the sins of the whole world. Let's wonder about our story together. I wonder, how do you think Joseph's brothers felt when Jacob gave Joseph the beautiful robe, has there ever been a time where you felt like someone else was loved more than you? How does that feel? What can we say to God when we have feelings like that? I wonder, how do you think Joseph felt when he sat at the bottom of the dark well or when he was in prison? Was he afraid? Did he miss his father and his mother? Did he know that God was with him? Has there ever been a time when you've been afraid? Really afraid? Has there ever been a time when you felt like nothing good could happen? When Joseph met his brothers many years later, he forgave them, but not because what they did was okay. It's because he knew that God had been with him every step of the way. 
I wonder, are there any places in your life where it's hard to see that God is working? What can we say to God about those places? Let's pray together. God, you are always with us. You are always at work and you can turn evil to good. God, you are forgiving. Can you help us to forgive like you have forgiven us? Thank you for sending Jesus to be our true Prince of Peace and to rescue and forgive the sins of the whole world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in praying the Collect of the Day. Keep, O Lord, your household, the Church, in continual godliness, that through your protection it may be free from all adversities and devoutly serve you in good works, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Phoebe Lukey, and I've been attending Res for about 12 years. And I'm Don Lukey, and I've been attending Res for about 14 years. We live in the Eckington neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Please join us as we read Psalm 10 responsively by whole verse. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at times, your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord. O oh God, lift up your hand, do not forget the afflicted. Why, Why does, does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, You will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless are, commits itself, for you have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O oh Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressor, so that the man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning, is now, and, and shall be, world without end. Amen. Hi, Res. We are Stephanie and Andrew Evans, and we live in the Fairlawn neighborhood of Washington, D.C. We've been going to Res for about seven years. Our reading this morning comes from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. 
Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're continuing in our sermon series in the book of James, and today we're in James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. I'd like to begin by imagining for a moment that you're an alien who has just crash-landed your spaceship here in Washington, D.C., which even to those of us who live here uh, feels oftentimes like it is the most far-out place in the galaxy. Um, And as someone who is brand new, not only to the city, but also to our planet, uh, you're trying to sort out who's who in Washington's unending political drama. How do you differentiate between all the different players, the various leaders and their opponents? One category you might consider would be religious affiliation, because certainly on the face of it, there are significant differences between the various religions in planet Earth. Yet here in Washington, sorting leaders according to religious affiliation isn't that helpful because the overwhelming majority of them here identify as Christians. Both President Trump and Vice President Pence do. So does former Vice President Biden and his running mate, Senator Harris, as does Kanye West and his running mate, who is apparently an online pastor, which is something I might have made fun of in the past, but now I find myself with the same title suddenly. So all of these people happen to be Christians, at least in name. As a newcomer to our city, how might you further differentiate between all these self-professing Christians? Well, I suppose that you would learn to do what James advises, which is to take note of not only what they say, but also what they do. Sulmani Megadi last week pointed out that a self-professing Christian who doesn't practice the faith is like a person who wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror, finding unkempt hair and still in the PJs, yet immediately forgets and goes off to work looking just the same. It's ridiculous. And in Chapter 1 of his letter, James says, it's a dangerous self-deception contrary to the Christian life. Just saying that you're a Christian doesn't make it so. It requires a radical change in allegiance to Jesus as your king and consequently a radical realignment of practices in keeping with Jesus' rule. Claiming to be a Christian while continuing to live as though you're not is what James calls double-mindedness. It's like trying to stand with one foot on the dock and one foot in a canoe. Sooner or later, you're gonna find yourself in neither one, but instead in the river. I'm sure that it was not a blessing to James to learn that there were already Christians in name only amongst the congregations of the first century. But it is of great comfort to us that James addressed this problem in his letter. Thank God that we don't have to work out a solution now. In his letter, James outlines a way to overcome the double-mindedness. And it involves not just hearing God's word, but also, in fact, doing it. Since being Christians in name only is a problem of self-deception, It stands to reason that we all may be a lot more culpable here than we realize. So James provides us in today's reading with a test case. In chapter 2, verses 1 and following, he focuses on one particular way that double-mindedness pops up within churches, namely partiality, or what we call today discrimination. 
And as we look at this passage more closely together, if you'll come with an open heart and an open mind, I believe that you'll find, as I have, that I did forget to brush my hair and change out of my PJs today before I left the house. Discrimination is so hardwired within us, we need supernatural help to root it out. So let's pray for insight and pray for help with this transformation as we open God's word together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for James, for his practical, simple instructions. Yet they're so hard to put into practice. We need your help. So fill us with your Holy Spirit to understand and then to go ahead and practice what it is you say to us through your word. For you pray in Jesus' name. Amen. James' argument in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13 is very simple. First, discrimination is bad for the church. That's what he covers in the first seven verses. And then in the next section, discrimination is bad for us. So let's look at each of these sections together, starting in verses 1 to 7, where James says discrimination is bad for the church. James begins in chapter 2, verse 1, exhorting us to put our faith into action by showing no partiality. And then he illustrates his point in verse 2 with a comparison between two visitors to the church assembly. One visitor is rich. He's wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. The other is poor and filthy. And in verse 3, James shows how discrimination plays out. The rich man is given a place of honor, while the poor man is not. And there's nothing at all surprising about this, because it's the way of the world in every culture, in every time. Poor people are powerless. Rich people are powerful. So people in the middle have always catered to the rich while dismissing the poor. What would have been surprising is if both men in James's illustration had been treated with dignity. I have a friend who was a bona fide hippie back in the 1970s when he came to faith. He's a white guy with genuinely the biggest afro that I have ever seen. Tie-dyed shirt, lots of bead necklaces, and uh, open sandals, the whole nine yards. He was also one of these people who didn't go anywhere without his knitting because he said it helped him to focus. And he tells the story of going with some other of his hippie Jesus people friends to hear a famous theologian who was speaking at a very formal, very old Presbyterian church. And when they arrived, the church was packed, and so they walked down to the very front of the building, in front of all the pews, packed with all of these people in their suits and dresses. And they sat down cross-legged on the floor and my friend took out his knitting and began to knit. And all eyes were on this one church elder dressed in a suit who got up and started making his way towards the newcomers to address the situation. And everyone was thinking, what is he going to do? How is he going to resolve this breach of decorum before such a famous guest speaker with so many other guests watching. What do you think he did when he got there? The old man got down on the floor, right in his suit, and sat cross-legged right beside them, listening to the speaker. I love this story because it's so wonderfully surprising, but isn't it sad that there are so many stories to the contrary, of exactly the opposite happening. Some famous stories, but countless stories that have been forgotten, especially, uh, particularly here in the United States, of African-American people coming into the church, a predominantly white church, and being asked to leave, or being asked to sit up in the balcony. And why are these stories so commonplace and unsurprising? It's because of double-mindedness within the church. Christians not practicing what they profess, but instead practicing the same discriminatory habits of the secular world. Instead of regarding everyone with dignity, verse 4, we make distinctions among ourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Note that the problem here that James is talking about is not judgment per se, 
but it's value judgments. There's nothing wrong with observing things about the people we meet. It's what you do with the observations that can be either good or evil. Take, for example, a person with disabilities who comes into the church. For example, a person who is hard of hearing on the left side and who always turns her head uh, to listen. If you don't observe this and make the necessary adjustments in order to accommodate this person's need, you'll not be a very good friend, will you? But likewise, if you do observe this and you begin to steer clear of that person, saying, I really just don't like people who can't hear me in stereo, well then, that's a huge problem. You're judging with evil thoughts, just as James says. It's not the judging that's wrong, it's the evil judging. And we do this whenever we say, because of what I've observed about this particular person, he or she is of no value to me. Again, this is the way of the world. It's been this way for millennia, and it's still the same way today. Take, for example, a cocktail party here on Capitol Hill. If somehow you get an invitation and you're able to get into the party and uh, then begin to meet someone who's in a position of influence, and then they discover that you're not employed, or you work as a nanny, or you didn't go to college, or you went to college in Florida, or some other kind of disqualifier. Well, what happens then? They turn aside to talk with someone else, don't they? No matter how many times you experience it, each time it always hurts, because it's wrong, because it's not the way people should be treated. But let's be honest, if you go to a cocktail party on Capitol Hill, what did you expect? That's the way the world works. But it should not be the way the church works. We should see the image of God in every person and treat one another with dignity and with respect, no matter the skin color, no matter the gender, the attractiveness, the age, the marital status, the political party, the influence, anything else. When we fail to do so and when we discriminate, it's bad for the church, particularly because it perpetuates the kind of mistreatment that most of our brothers and sisters experience all the time anyways. Take a look at verse 5 where James says, Hasn't God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? See, those whom the world regards as worthless, in fact, make up most of the church. That's the way it was in James's time. It's still that way today. Most Christians around the world today are poor. So whenever we disregard or undervalue the poor, we're dishonoring our own people, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And not only does discrimination dishonor many within the church, it also does them real harm. For again, the way the world works is that the powerful invariably oppress the powerless. In James's day, this included, verse 6, the rich dragging the poor to court, and verse 7, disparaging their good name. Likewise today, the rich know how to work the global economy in such a way that it enslaves the poor, trapping them in systems that keep them poor while the rich keep getting richer. And the powerful know how to work the judicial system and the court of public opinion to ensure that the powerless remain powerless against them. And in the end, what all of this means is that most of our current brothers and sisters in the church continue to suffer at the hands of the wealthy and the powerful, the influential people and the systems that they represent. So whenever we as Christians kowtow to them or follow them or like them, we perpetuate systems that are bad for the church. But that's not all, because in the rest of today's passage, James goes on to show how discrimination is also bad for us. Not only bad for the church, but it's also bad for us, and here's why. We were made to live freely under the Lord, and when we rebel against the Lord and against his benevolent rule, we inevitably suffer the consequences, first of chaos and pain, but eventually we suffer death. You may remember that when asked about God's law, Jesus summarized it in terms of loving God 
and neighbor. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. But as James pointed out, and we also discovered when you crash landed your spaceship here in Washington, self-deception is a serious problem. It's possible to profess Christ without practicing Christ. So at the end of James's chapter one, he gave us concrete examples of Jesus's summary of the law. What does loving your neighbor look like? According to James 127, he says it's looking after widows and orphans in their affliction. In other words, valuing and caring for those whom the world regards as powerless and valueless. And what does loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind look like, according to James 1.27? Well, it's keeping yourself unstained from the world. That is, not returning to old worldly habits, worldly idols, and the ways of the world that follow different gods, including discrimination. But here's how self-deception often works. Even though we have professed Christ, there are still areas in our lives where we fail to practice Christ. And though we should know that we should probably give attention to those dark corners of our hearts, we instead dwell on the areas where our conduct is more honorable. And we give ourselves a pass on everything else. So we ignore the dark corners of our hearts as they continue to rot and fester and do us harm. Now to see how this plays out, imagine someone on trial for murder who's clearly guilty and almost certain to receive the death penalty, yet who offers no defense whatsoever, but instead drones on and on about what a faithful husband he's been all his life. That's the kind of thing we often do to keep on deceiving ourselves regarding our practice of the Christian faith. James puts all of this together in verses 8 through 11, saying these things a little better than me. If you really fulfill the royal law, James says in verse 8, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality or discriminate, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. You see, imagine a devastated son saying to his father, Dad, why did you kill that man? And the father saying in reply, I never once cheated on your mother, son. Aren't you proud of me? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yet James is right to challenge us in just this same fashion regarding the issue of discrimination within the church. Dad, why was racism such a problem in our home and in the church we attended growing up? Well, son, what's important to remember is that we went to church every Sunday and we were faithful in tithing. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Just as we once did, now the little ones among us are observing everything that we do Someday someday they're going to ask us why. I wonder how we will answer them when they ask. If we're ever going to break free from this self-deception, it's going to be with the Lord's help, through his grace. And so in verses 12 and 13, James gives us certain hope in Christ, not only for forgiveness of our transgressions, but also for real and lasting change. We can, in fact, change. We can become people who walk the walk. Let's look at how we do that in verses 12 and 13. Here's what James says. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Notice right at the beginning of verse 12 that James is inviting us to an integrated life so that we are no longer Christians in name only, but Christians whose actions match our profession. Our actions are in full alignment with our speech. 
And how can we have this? By putting our hearts fully in Jesus' hands. His death and resurrection for us is the only lasting cure for those dark corners of our hearts that continue to rot and fester as we look away. When we give him our hearts, give our hearts to Jesus, saying, I am fully yours, both word and deed, he leads us through death and on to resurrection life on the other side. It's a promise that he assures us of in eternity, but it's something that he brings into the present so we experience it right now. We become new creation people even now. Now someday, Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And on that day, some will say, as James says in verse 13, some will receive judgment without mercy, because that's what the law requires. Whether you were a murderer who was a very faithful husband, or whether you were a discriminator who nevertheless went to church every Sunday and faithfully gave your tithe, you will nevertheless be found guilty of the ways that you have broken God's law. Despite your good record in some categories, your self-righteousness will just simply be insufficient for the crisis at hand. But also on Judgment Day, many will receive mercy through Jesus Christ and faith in him. In verse 1, James described him as Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. But Jesus, the righteous one, set aside his gold ring and his fancy clothes in order to put on our filthy rags so that we might share in his riches. Jesus willingly took a seat on the floor with us so that we might have a seat with him at his table. Jesus became powerless so that we might become powerful to overcome the world. So, through Jesus' mercy, not only can we be rescued from sin and death, but we can also share in his glory. And that's wonderful news, especially for those who are poor, those who are weak, those who are powerless. Yet doing so, sharing in this glory with Jesus, means a path of humiliation in the present. It means humbling ourselves, taking up our crosses, and following him. And it's on the way of the cross with Jesus that we become people of mercy like Jesus. So choose wisely, then, the path you will take. The way of power and wealth and self-righteousness leads to judgment without mercy. But the way of the cross leads to judgment under the law of liberty, and that's where mercy triumphs over judgment. So speak and so act, James says, as those who have been shown such great mercy, and then go and share that mercy generously with others. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this good word from James and for the hope we have in your mercy. Meet us in the way of the cross. Teach us your ways, O oh Lord Jesus, for we long to be like you. And we pray in your name, amen.
Good morning, Res. This is Chris and Aaron Ream. We're actually Res alumni. We've been gone from DC for a couple of years now, and we're currently living in Lancaster, California. Uh, we're thankful for this opportunity to worship with you guys this morning. We miss you. Now let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Steve Breedlove, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our President Donald Trump, our Mayor Muriel Bowser, and Governors Larry Hogan of Maryland, Ralph Northam of Virginia, and Gavin Newsom of California. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. I now invite you to add your own prayers and petitions at home. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As Christ our Savior has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Hi, I'm Jared Walzak. I live in Alexandria and I'm a newer attender at Res. Please join me in making a confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another with the peace of Christ. Send greetings of peace to others near and far. And as you do, let me remind you of some things that are happening in the life of the church. If you're new, there's information here on the screen on how you can go to our website and you can say hello to us. Um, you can find out more about the church there. You can also sign up for our next newcomers gathering on October 25th, Sunday evening at 7 o'clock. We'd love to have you join us and get to know you a little bit more there. There's also lots of other things to sign up for on the website, ways that you can uh, ask for care through the Res 911 system, ways for you to volunteer to help, ways for you to seek assistance or, or uh, volunteer to be a part of any number of teams. We'd love to have you in one of our classes happening this fall. There's still time to sign up for the calling class with Dr. Jeff Bailey, saying a deeper yes, discerning God's call. It meets three Tuesday nights in October, starting uh, this coming Tuesday or on the 13th of October. Um, and you can sign up for that on the website. Today, immediately following the service um, in Lincoln Park, 11.45 a.m., uh, we will be gathering for Eucharist. You are most welcome to join us. Uh, bring bread and bring a cup, and you can join with us there. Meet in the southeast corner of Lincoln Park, and we'll be able to give you directions for where to go from there. This is the time in our service when we usually take up an offering. This is a way that we as Christians worship the Lord together. We give generously back to him because he has given so generously to us. I invite you to give online. You can find out more information about how to give to our church there on our website. We appreciate your giving. Through your generous giving, you help us share the gospel here in DC and around the world. So thank you for your continued giving. Now let's join together in singing again. I invite you to stand and sing along and I'll be back to say farewell in just a few moments.
Thanks for joining us for worship today. Now receive the benediction. All our problems. We send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties. We send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works. We send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes. We set on the risen Christ. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this week and forever. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Bye-bye.